Good morning and welcome to Church for the Harvest. Happy Sunday, happy Super Bowl Sunday. I'm so glad that you could make it this morning and I've got a few announcements for you so we'll jump right into those. Please join us for a time of corporate prayer from 9 to 10 a.m. on Saturdays. Prayer is a powerful weapon against the enemy and a great way to support one another. Prayer request cards are available at the info desk and we would love to pray for you. You are invited to a Super Bowl party tonight at 5 p.m. here at Harvest. Bring a dish or an appetizer to share with serving utensils. If you're not into football, bring your favorite game to play. Contact Caitlin Gergen or Kelsey Brown with any questions. Join Lynn Lohman for a woman's life group at her home on the study on the book Invading Babylon, the Seven Mountain Mandate. This will be a seven-week study on Thursday evenings from 6.30 to 8 p.m. beginning February 17th. A workbook will be provided. A Deeper Kind of Calm is a woman's life group led by Terry Salmon. This four-week study starts on Wednesday, March 16th at 6.30 p.m. and child care will be provided. Scan the QR code on the screen to join one of these life groups or to see all of the groups available this spring. Guest services and children's ministry teams, we are excited to start serving in our new church building. Join us at noon on Sunday, February 20th for pizza and training at the new church. This meeting is open for all who serve or would like to serve in the children's classrooms or as ushers, greeters, info desk, hospitality, parking lot, and security. The more the merrier. Sign up at the info desk to let us know you're coming. Men, mark your calendars. The tool exchange is rescheduled for Friday, April 1st at 6 p.m. Come for a fun evening of food and fellowship. There will be two more Biblical Citizenship in Modern America classes starting the end of February. These classes will meet once a week from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. and will last eight weeks. The Monday evening class will be held right here at Harvest beginning on February 28th, and the Thursday evening class will be held at the Bridge in Hancock beginning February 24th. That is all I have for announcements for you this morning. I hope you have a great rest of your week and you can now prepare your tithe and offering. Good morning. Uh, Phil Salmon's doing the offering this morning, but before <laughs> we turn the mic over to him, my name is Angie Gergen and I oversee our guest services. And I am so excited because we are on the countdown right now. We just have a handful of Sundays here till we move to our new church home at 1425 41st Avenue over there. Amen. And I am so excited about that because it's such a great time. It's a transitional time. And during our prayer and fasting this past week, I just saw the Lord like just so excited and setting out the table and then seeing guests come in by the droves and going, yep, we've got room for more. Put out another plate. We got room for more. Let's add another table. We got room for more. I am so excited to see that happen. Are you not excited? Amen. Amen. So we have our guest services meeting next Sunday at our new church building, 1425 41st Avenue. Keep that in your mind. Uh, my um, address when I was a kid was 4025 West Chicago. So I got this <laughs> memorized, 1425 41st Avenue, our new church building. If you serve in children's ministry as an usher, a door greeter on our hospitality team, altar ministry, security, we want you to come. We know you got kids. Bring them with. It's going to be a great time. We're anticipating guests coming to our new church home, and we want to welcome them with excellence, and we want you to be very familiar with our new church home and know how to do that. There's a sign-up sheet at the information desk. So far, we are, uh, only have about 20 people signed up, so we know we're shy of a lot of you. Um, there's a sign-up sheet. There's also a QR code in your um, email. Please sign up so we know how much pizza to provide everyone. For the handful of you that that doesn't include, we'll find a place for you to serve. We have a serving church, and so we would just invite you to come and check it out as well. So uh, just sign up so we know how much pizza to order. And now we'll turn it over. Give Phil a warm welcome. Thank you. The enthusiasm. That's going to be a tough act to follow. Uh, I'm Phil Salmon. I'm with the guest services team. We have a great bunch of folks on that team. Um, so I encourage you, if you're interested, uh, get involved with that. i get my phone to turn on. Here we go. Uh, I was really blessed to have great in-laws. Some of you who are married, you may not have that experience. If you are not married, do not worry about your in-laws. If you marry a godly man or woman, that'll, God will take care of that. After my mother-in-law passed away for many years, my father-in-law spent a lot of time every day. He would clean that house and keep the kitchen and the living room and their bedroom the way his wife kept it because he loved her and that was her house and she took care of it and raised the children there 
And he did that out of love for his wife. He took care of, he vacuumed. He, he, he had no expectation of receiving anything except that was another, just another way of him expressing his love for her and the things that she cared about. It was very important to him, and he made sure that a guest who came kept the house the way she wanted that house kept. God wants us to do the same thing. This is his house. Our new building is his house. Your heart is his house. Your house is his house. Christ told his disciples in John 14, he said, If you love me, you will obey my commandments. And the reference there is not just to the Ten Commandments, but all the teachings and sayings and the examples that Jesus set. If you love me, you will keep things the way I keep things. And that includes tithing. Tithing supports the ministries of this church. It supports the building. It supports the greeters. It's a very important aspect. But we don't tithe to expect something in return. We, we're, we're tithe out of love. God's looking for your heart. He doesn't have any other motive. He doesn't need the money. Well, obviously, if you don't need the money, he'll provide what we need. If you really walk in faith and you obey his commands, he will provide for all of your needs. And one of those things he expects is tithes. But he wants it from your love, not from an obligation. We need him to keep that in mind with our tithes. As you prepare those, oh, I, I was supposed to mention children are released. Sorry. I'm in trouble. Kids can go now. I apologize. Um, so you prepare your tithes. There's a number of ways you can give. We have drop boxes by the kitchen and the front door. Uh, Venmo, PayPal. I prefer texting. It's real easy. Ding, 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 boom, and it's done. You don't have to worry about when to do it or anything like that. Um, so let's pray this morning over the offering and, and, uh, and the hearts of all the givers. Lord, we praise you this morning, and we thank you for your tremendous outpouring of blessings into our lives. Lord, look, we, we need to look at tithes as an extension of how we show you our love. And, and we just are so grateful, Father God, that you continue to bless us, to bless all the givers in this church. Speak to our hearts, Father God, and draw us closer to you that we can speak to others and draw them into this new church building and grow that building and grow your kingdom on earth. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for the wisdom to use these ties to glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. I've been wrestling with purpose. What was I created for? I'm more than what you see on the surface. See beneath my skin and scars. I'm skinned and scarred, marred and twisted, scarred by the past I need to be lifted. And sometimes I question my own existence. What was I put here for? In my seams, it seems that there seems to be more. It's like I'm a light unplugged from the socket. I mean, do I really exist to put money in my pocket? This nine to five feels like a nine to nine. My mind entwined, I pass the time, life circles me as I wait. What is my estate? I feel like I was made for something great, and yet I can't quite put my finger on it. But when I look at my fingers and I see their design, I realize I'm one of a kind, and something created me. No, someone created me, and that someone made me for a reason. Even though it's clear the past years have been treason, I still sense this drawing, this calling, that even in the midst of my falling, there was someone who died to pick me up, someone who rose to fix me up, someone who's coming back to lift me up. And that someone is Jesus. See, God made me for a purpose. And when I delight in Him, it's brought to the surface. Well, good morning, church. <clears throat> we apologize for the low lighting, but many of you know that we are repurposing uh, a lot of our equipment so we could save in our new building. So for those uh, watching online or Facebook, that's really who it affects. Most of you can, I think, see me this morning with my bright white sweater and shining white sneakers. Amen. <clears throat> So, but we welcome all those on Facebook, and, and in a few weeks, we'll have amazing lights. But in the interim, thank you for your patience. Um, I also want to thank, uh, I think this is one of the greatest seasons of prayer and fasting that we had with turnout of people. Monday night, Tuesday night, and then Wednesday, uh, there was 75 to 85 people there that worshiped, testified, and uh, it was a 
uh, an amazing uh, time that night uh, in our building. And the first meeting there was a time of seeking the Lord, praying, fasting. So I'm thrilled by that, and thank you. I want to also thank uh, all those that help with moving. You come in the frigid cold, and you help move, and, and that, that means a lot. And so as a church, as a staff, we're so thankful. You give of your time, and you bring your kids, in, and thank you. It's the kingdom of God moving forward. And how many want to hear some good news this morning? Hopefully everything's been good news so far, but greater good news. Um, you know, we, we exceeded our, uh, our goal of 300,000, and many of you saw the video on that. And uh, we wound up uh, at the beginning of the year at 339,000. <clears> well, <throat> funds have been coming in, and I just want to thank you and continue to encourage you, though, uh, if you feel the tug of the Lord and you want to be a part of the Destiny Miracle, you can. And people are. Uh, so uh, as of January 1 till now, 56544 more dollars have come in. So we are at $395,544 towards our goal. <clears throat> so thank you. And uh, you can jump in and be a part of that. I mean, we're not, once again, strong-arming anybody, but uh, I'm just shocked of how what the Lord is doing and continues to do in the church. Can you say amen? Well, let's jump into it. Father, I humble myself before you, and I recognize that in and of myself, I have nothing good to say, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, I ask that you speak through me and give to your people today what they need to hear from you. I bless the people of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to uh, uh, Luke chapter 18. We'll get to that in a moment. But I want to talk to you, continue in our series. This is the fourth week, God's Destiny Moments, and talking about following God's opinion. So I can't see any monitor there, so I'm going to have to occasionally look back, uh, following uh, God's opinion. And I have this quote by Stephen Maraboli. He was an author, lecturer, and a veteran. And if you can pull that up, that quote, it's the next slide. He says, be careful. If the opinion of others is your gauge, then it is also your goal. If you concern yourself with what others think, then you can only go as far as others think, and you are better than that. Interesting, even come from a, a secular lecturer. Uh, our text, Luke 18, 8, uh, 8, Jesus says, I tell you that he will defend and avenge them quickly. Somebody shall quickly. <clears throat> when the Son of Man comes... Will he find this kind of persistent faith? We'll get into more of that, Lord willing, next week on earth. God will grant them justice quickly. Somebody shall quickly. So we've been talking about the destiny moments, the timing of the Lord. One of our texts was in Galatians 6, 9. So let us not get tired of doing what is good at just the right, right time. Time. Keros is what that means. Carol's time, and we talked about that uh, that word meaning the opportune time, the opportune season or a fitting time. It's a suitable time for action to take place, and so God will bring these destiny moments in and through our life. I believe, and we are experiencing that. And and God does; He almost like He accelerates in our life something. But here's the thing: there needs to be a response on our part. Did you get that? There's a response. There's some type of action of faith or obedience that in that moment. And we said this word time is different than chronos time. Uh, chronos time is like the Dunkin' Donuts ad. You heard me say, I got to get up and make the donuts. And how many know that we all live in chronos time? Get up, go to, uh, y'all get up, go to work, get on the road, whatever you got to do in the morning, whatever. And, and, and that's, we live in that. But God intersects our lives. Thank God for that. Amen. And so we need to be faithful, watch this, in, the, in those chronos times so we can experience his Kairos time. And I want to talk to you, if I can get to it, into it with time, the time today, uh, about what hijacks a lot of people uh, uh, in, in missing or maybe I could say delaying our Kairos moment. And I'll get into that in a minute. But <clears throat> last week we talked about uh, the lepers, the four lepers, 
and uh, they said this, why should we wait here till we die in second kings? And we said that there's death in doing nothing. How many know that faith is action? Faith is action. It's decision. In the kingdom of God, it says in Genesis 1, when the spirit of God moved, God's spirit is always moving. <clears throat> Are you involved? Are you uh, on board when God is moving? And what happens to a lot of uh, believers is they, they camp out and they settle in. And, and we don't, I, I just recently heard a, a national pastor say that he, he pastored a very large church. And, and, and after he pastored that, he said, Lord, he would pray every Sunday, this church is yours. And it is, it's your church. And he said, but if you'd have me do something more difficult, I'll do it. <laughs> you know, that's not usually in the mind of pastors after they're done. Do something a little bit less difficult. Come on, somebody. Are you out there? Amen. <laughs> so, and we talked about uh, that word waiting and, and actually doesn't, you know, mean to sit around. Well, just waiting on the Lord. Just, just waiting, and, and it actually means to wait like a waiter. Now, how many of you, don't raise your hands on this, a bad waiter? God bless good waiters, amen? And, it's, you, and, and there's something about a waiter, when they wait, they're attentive. You don't have to ask, come on, to have your water filled. Come on, somebody, amen? Because they know, they watch, right? And they're watching. So waiting has to do, it's, it's not passive, it's active, all right, so so you need to know that God wants you in a active state, and, and if you stay in an active, pursuing, waiting state, you will have your you will have your Kairos moment. Can you say Amen? And so, uh, so let me just continue here, and I'll throw some stuff out about Joseph, some of the suddenlies in Egypt, in Genesis chapter fifty, Genesis chapter fifty, verse twenty, and the Bible says, even though I, I love this verse because he had tremendous foresight. Even though Joseph is speaking, you planned evil against me, talking to his brothers when they showed up in Egypt. God planned good to come out of it. I want you to just think about that for a moment. How long did it take Joseph to come to that revelation? How many know when something ugly happens to you, something bad? That's usually not how we respond. You did this, I remember when, and I'll, don't you tell me. Come on, amen. But, but he, he knew he knew somehow that he had this understanding that, that even in the negative, the bad, the painful, horrible thing that happened to him, that, that God was in that bringing him along. How many with me say amen? And so God planned good to come out of it. And it was to keep many people alive as he is doing. And so, you know, he was mistreated for 13 plus years, betrayed by his brothers. You know, some of the most painful betrayal can be by family. Isn't that right? It's very painful. It's very painful. The Bible says a brother or sister offended. It's harder to be one. And there are contentions of those like bars of a castle. Sometimes it takes other people outside family to, to minister to family. How many hear what I'm saying? That's all I'll leave on that. But he was sold into slavery, put in prison, something he didn't do. That wasn't easy for this young man. But how many know that some things need to be shaved off of Joseph? Come on, he had the coat of many colors. He was the favorite. Now, some of you in here may have been the favorite of your parents. I was not. <laughs> well, I love my parents, but how many know what I'm saying? There's always a, and they'll, you know, no, 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 we love you all equally. Well, that's true, you know, and you should, and that's the way it is, but you love them in different ways because they just e e differently exemplify a life that, that is admirable. And, and so, but anyhow, but, but, but the day Joseph's dad favored him, he gave him the coat. And those guys weren't just upset and mad for a day. You got a double portion of this. No, they wanted to kill him. How many know that's pretty hurtful? Okay, that's pretty hurtful. And they did. They threw him in a pit. Pit. Someone once said that pit is the preachers in training. But all of us wind up at times in a pit, right? <laughs> it's a little slow this morning, but you'll catch up. <clears throat> and uh, they, they knew this. And then when they were before him, and he's now second in power and command, we'll get into that in a moment. Uh, 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 the Bible says, I don't have this verse on the PowerPoint, Genesis 42, 21, they're re recollecting, they said, when we saw the distress and anguish of Joseph's soul, uh, we would not listen to him. And one trans translation said he had floods of tears and quivering lips. He's in the pit. And what do they do? As soon as they fill in the pit, they go eat. 
When you eat, it's symbolic of solidarity and unity against something. And so they came together and they ate, and he's he's howling, let me out, he's crying. How many of us are devastated? How many of you know that that verse, God meant it for good, you meant evil, probably was not on his mind, right? So there was a time and there's a time. And so the suffering and the, the disillusionment and the pain at times, God will turn those things for our good if we don't quit. And sometimes it's years later. What am I trying to say? Don't quit. Continue on with the Lord. Because a perspective will come in your life. Are you listening this morning? That you'll be able to go, it was God and he was with me. You can cry then tears of joy. And we are today. Amen. So suddenly at 30 years old, one morning, Joseph was sitting in prison. Seemed like another ordinary day, making the donuts, rotting away. When the guards came in and they said to Joseph, Pharaoh wants to see you. And I can just imagine what he's thinking. You know what? The Pharaoh, I don't know him. I don't have an appointment with him. Maybe he's going to kill me on the spot. And I'm in prison and, and Pharaoh's calling me. But notice this verse. Uh, you can pull it up. Genesis 41, 14. It said, then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they quickly brought. Someone shout quickly. They quickly, he's in his moment right now, out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself, which meant he probably looked like a gorilla then there, and changed his clothes, showered, came, he came before Pharaoh. One translation says, hastily and hurriedly, immediately they caused him to run out of that pit. Isn't there a song? I came running out of that grave. Amen. <laughs> they, and I can just see this when they grabbed him, the, 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 the intensity on their face and the joy. And he's not knowing what's going on, but they're ushering saying, Pharaoh wants to see you. Pharaoh wants to see you. Hurry up. You're going to get clean. And, and he's thinking, why, why, what, what's going on? And he knows nothing. He's in his destiny moment. How many know God knows how to have the right people come looking for you? <laughs> come, you, no, you're not going to believe this. This is what happened. You're not going to believe this. That's right. I don't know if I'm going to believe it, but God does it. And so you may feel like you're at a disadvantage. Maybe that you're overlooked. You're just there making the donuts. God has forgotten about you. No, the one who matters most, he has his eyes still on you. Can you say amen? He controls the universe, the most high God. He is watching out and he is working out his plan for your life. No matter what the enemy throws at you. And so, you know, you, you, you think about this. Joseph, he walks in. He walks into the presence of one of the most powerful people of that day. What does he do? Here's this thing about a dream that Joseph he could, could not, a, a Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dream. He couldn't, he didn't know how to interpret it. And, jo, and so Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dream. And, and then Pharaoh's so impressed. What does he do? He makes him the prime minister of Egypt, second in command. When he would come by, they would say, bow the knee. To Joseph. It's insane. It just seems like from one moment in obscurity to the next moment, thrust in to a whole nation, second in command. It happened quickly. How many of you know that Joseph, he didn't have to run for office? He didn't have to interview for anything. Right on the spot, he was promoted. And God knows how to do a quick work. Amen. Joseph woke up one morning, a slave in prison. He went to bed that night. The prime minister promoted and vindicated by God. Amen. So I want you, don't be discouraged by what's not changing. And, and it's easy to get discouraged and it's sorrowful. And, and I've, you know, there are going to be times I would imagine that he wept, he cried, and he reasoned and he wondered, but then he'd go back to the dream. He'd go back to the promise. Come on, somebody. He'd go back to what God said about you in your situation or him in his situation. How many know that happiness is not the absence of problems? It's the ability to deal with them. Yeah, it was free. <clears throat> like Joseph, you may be doing the right thing and the wrong thing is happening, but your time is coming if you remain faithful, if you're dialed in. God, I believe, has these destiny moments where he's going to suddenly do something in your midst and he brings you to a new level. So remain faithful. We serve God, not <clears throat> for his hand and the thing he does, but we serve him for who he is. He's God Almighty. Amen. There's a scripture you can pull up, Romans 8, 28, in the Amplified. I like it. it says, and we know that with great confidence that God, who is deeply concerned about us. Did you hear that? In the moment, you don't feel it. You feel an obscurity. Now, where are you, God? I've said that more times. Lord, I've done everything I know right. Where are you in this midst? 
Mm. He's deeply concerned about what uh, about us, and he causes all things to work together as a plan for good for those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Actually, in the Greek, all things includes persecution and suffering. Ugh. You know, there's one I grew up, grew up in the uh, in the Word of Faith movement, and there's a lot of golden nuggets and truths and, about the profession and confession. And I don't walk around, and I said this before in one of my messages, that, that, uh, that you know, I'm, I walk around that bad things are going to happen to me today. I don't walk around that way. And when bad things happen, I was like, well, we're going to come through this in Jesus' name. Though I walk through the valley of death, I, 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 the shadow, I will fear no evil. So I'm gonna, we're going to walk through it. But there's some people there that, that on their vocabulary is constantly, well, if it's something new, you know what? That's my luck. Well, nothing works out for me. Well, if something bad's going to happen, it's, and, and you better be very careful about that. Not saying those words. All things work together. They contribute. They contribute. They shall cooperate. They shall mutually contribute to our good. I like that. It was back in the summer of 1993 where I felt I was in the pit, maybe preacher in training. And uh, my wife and I, uh, it was five years after graduating from uh, theology training in, in Texas and I got a job working what I knew back in, in dry cleaning as a spotter. And I would commute from the South Shore to the North Shore, which was only probably about 35 miles, but sometimes would take two hours with traffic, two and a half hours. And so I'd have to get up sometimes 4, 3.30 in the morning so it wouldn't be so insane. And, and I felt like I was losing my mind. I've had this dream. I didn't see where we're at today and now, and what's that? I, but there was a dream in my heart that I felt that God put. While I'm there in 110 degrees, spotting out stains in people's clothes and a rack of, you know, all the stuff, the compressor comes back and they have a stain and they hang it on the rack. And they, so you got to take that out and try. And it isn't just steaming something out. You got 30 or 40 chemicals you have to use to pull that out. Some of you have to wash first or whatever. And, and a good spotter can get most stains out. Some stains you cannot. Here's just the thing. When you take stuff to dry cleaning, please don't leave the pens in your pockets. Because if we go, oh, it's an ink load. And the ink, will, you know, every garment has ink on it. And that would take hours, hours. Anyhow. And, and so I felt like I was losing my mind. And, and, and I just, I remember, I can remember. And here's the thing. My wife hadn't told me anything about this, that there was a call and communication from out here, from Pastor Steve Cornemont to come on staff. This was back in 1993. And I basically said, I'm going to check myself into a nut house basically, because I'm losing my mind here. And I just, I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm not going to, uh, something's just not good here. And um, I remember just crying and saying, Lord, just take this ministry, whatever pipe dream I, I may have called it or whatever, out of my life. Let me just focus on what I'm supposed to do in the business corporate world. And I'm buying this business. He wants to sell me this business with no money down. And he has few other dry stores. It's lucrative. And just why, why is this ministry call on my life and take it away or do something? That was a very desperate prayer. I was at my wit's end. <laughs> I was at my wit's end. Like, like Popeye. That's all I can stand. I can't stand no more. I was there. Well, then I go home and, um, Rhonda, my wife, tells me, well, two weeks ago, Pastor Steve called and wondered if you'd come on staff at the church out there and if you would leave everything here and go out there. What? Then I rationed, no, how could I go back? And that would seem like failure. But then the more I kind of wrestled and prayed, and, then, and so then he, he said, she said, uh, he's going to be calling you soon, a certain day. And so this is the honest to God truth. Okay, when people tell stories, they embellish, and sometimes pastors embellish, but my wife was there. She can vouch for this. When the phone rang, it was the ones that had cords on them. <laughs> it's a 93, okay? And so I had the extended cord. If you were really cool, you had a real long extended cord. You know, you go to a room and shut a door. 
And I remember just talking on that phone and he's talking, you know, presenting to me this position. It's a full-time position and you work with youth. I said, well, I have no training and nothing with youth. I know nothing. And uh, mostly my training has been in, in, in the ministry for pastoral or, or missions. And, but, uh, you know, contemplate and consider that. And while he's on the phone, I, they still had call wait back then too. I get a fo- phone call coming in. I said, just hold on, Pastor Steve. Click, click. It was the employer that employed my dad in the dry cleaning industry years ago. His name was Jerry Richman. He was a rich man. He owned most of the plants in New England. He goes, hey, I hear you're looking for buying a business. I got many businesses. I can get you started. I can get you set up. I can this. He had seven car garage stall of all the fancy like... uh, what was Back to the Future? That car, whatever that is. He had one of those. I mean, he is like, yeah, thank you, those of you. <clears throat> uh, and, and I remember being to his garage and seeing this, and this guy was affluent. And he's on the phone when I'm getting an opportunity to come back out here. We really, you know, uh, take a cut and pay, but, you know, well, you can start in ministry. Hold on, Jerry. Click, click. I'll call you back. And then back with Pastor Steve. And so the short of it is, is it, it, after a few weeks, just praying and wrestling, when I made a decision, I said, you know what? I'm coming back out to Minnesota. I don't know what, I don't know nothing, how to reach kids or whatever. All I knew was the Romans road to salvation. That was actually my first message. And the kids were like dying, <laughs> you know, but that youth group of 15 kids grew to a hundred. And we were busting kids from Fergus Falls, from Hoffman, from Alexandria, going out to the Ashby, and we eventually built a De- the Destiny Center out there back in 1998. And, and I love that church and the people, amazing group of people at Destiny Church. So if you're ever out in Ashby that way, if you live that way, they are amazing, amazing church family. And Pastor Steve is a dear, dear friend. And uh, we love that relationship. We have kept that up. And so what am I trying to say? All things work together for good. God will work it for good. Well, let me just continue here for the few moments we have left. The Bible says after the Israelites came through the Red Sea, they wandered in the desert for 40 years because of what? Unbelief. <clears throat> Remember the 12, we hear the word spies. Remember the story about the 12 spies? Uh, the Bible says that they were sent out to explore, not spy the land. There's a distinction I'm trying to make here. See, when you are sent out to explore something, you're examining for the purpose to discover and to go out. To spy means you observe secretly, watch this, with hostile intent. Moses never said to spy out the land. Deuteronomy 1.22, if you can pull that up. The Bible says clearly, it says, then all of you came near me and said, let us send men before us that they may explore the land. Let me see that same man. For us and bring us what? Word again of the way by which we must go up to the cities. In other words, show us, we got to take a left here to go here. This is a good road, whatever. Nothing to do about the giants. Nothing to do about the enemy, how strong they may be. Nothing. Moses didn't care about that. Come on, somebody. Right? He was concerned about just show us some of the route and the, and the detour of the land, not spy it out. I remember the story. They come back. Ten of the spies, or those that were supposed to explore, came back, actually, and they had a, they had a negative report. How many remember that? Well, watch this. Joshua and Caleb, the two, they had a good report when they returned. Why? Because they believed God's promise, right? <clears throat> that they were to inherit the land. They were to inherit the land. But the others came back. Now, I'm going to get into something here. The others came back with a, a factual report, the facts, or you could say that like today, you could say, well, the science says, uh-oh. But the facts or the science uh, was actually unbelief to God. Are you listening? It was unbelief. And actually the science or the facts was considered an evil report to God. They distrust God's promise to them, the ten. Pull this up, I have it. The opinion of 10 people caused 2 million people to wander in the desert for 40 years. 10 people caused almost 2 million people to go into bondage. Hmm. In other words, an 11-day journey, that's all it was, pretty much, 
turned into 40 years. What is this? This tells me many things, but this is the one thing I want to focus on. It's, it's, it's an example of being careful who you align with. Let me just bring it down to 2021 and 20, since 2020 to now. Be careful who you associate or whose opinion you embrace. Because though that person's opinion can set the stage for their life in the years to come. You know, here's the thing. I wish it wasn't true, uh, but it, it, in, in the negative, but in the positive, it's good. How many know when there's a good opinion, you've received wise counsel, right? So you meet with somebody and they give you godly counsel. They gave you God's opinion on the subject, and that can save your life. But how many know the enemy is out there with negative opinion? Are you listening? Amen? Negative opinion to distract you, to get you in, sidetracked or in your wilderness because you follow some foolish counseling. Now, I don't mean this maliciously, and I don't mean this unkindly, but I think it needs to be spoken. This whole China virus has caused major splits and divisions in tens of millions of people, and, and many of them church folk. Now, what, now, over these last few years, and in and, and some, it's just been like a split, it's ha, a, aligned or associated with the opinion of one way and some another. And, and how many know we serve a king, not a government? Amen. Amen. And that, that now, so what happens now, now, slowly, the truth is coming out about masks, about, come on, you got awful quiet, social distancing, isolation. Uh, John Hopkins, all, we're starting to see stuff like, wait a minute, this had zero effect or very minimal. And even the efficacy of the vaccinations, like, oh, okay. And so what happens is because of decisions uh, that some have embraced, uh, uh, that those decisions have consequences. Okay, and I'm talking about church family, church folk, and people that still, I met with the pastor, he said, I have people that have still not coming back after two years they're probably not ever coming back. <clears throat> what are you trying to say, Pastor Mike? <clears throat> uh, we, we need to watch out. This is, what's, this is what's happening, I believe. A spirit of pride is on a lot of, especially church folk. Because when you make a decision and it's wrong, how easy is it for you to change? No, you fight even if that decision is wrong to save face. Amen. He will preach a lot better, Pastor Mike, than I'm your respondent. Amen. And so what happened, I know it, and sometimes, well, you know, well, I just say, you know what, I was wrong. I'm sorry. That was dumb. I did that. Let's jump in. Amen. But not everybody responds. And so those decisions can affect a whole family, a whole family. And, 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 and they, they walk away from God's church and their kids and they suffer. And, and I really feel in, in a large sense that the spirit of pride post-pandemic is going to wreak more havoc on some families than the virus itself. Yeah, you, you, oh, yeah. you survived the virus, but what about your marriage? Oh, come on, somebody. You, you survived the virus, but what about your teenage son or daughter and what they're getting into right now? Come on. How about your family? How about your, you survived the virus, but what about your spiritual growth? Are you starting to wake up here this morning? It's like, oh, he's hitting stuff. But what about the command to not forsake the gathering of the local church? Do we just rip that out in Hebrews and go, we don't, you know, that God's doing a new thing. No, he sticks by his word. If it's written in his word, it's forever. Amen. How about corporate praise and worship? How can you corporately praise and worship and seek God when you're at, on listening to a podcast at home? And listen, podcasts, once again, are great. I listen to many of them. Many of you do. Podcasts are like taking vitamins. How many of you take vitamins? My wife always taking vitamins. But here's the thing. If you take too many vitamins on an empty stomach, you get sick. And church, it helps. You know, church is the, help, the stomach. It's the place that if you just feed on podcasts, you know what? Oh, you're missing the corporate worship. You're missing the, come on, somebody, amen? Are you there? Amen. Yeah, amen, amen. <laughs> My question is this, and I'll get off of that. Has Satan won by getting you out of the habit of church? I know I'm preaching to the crowd here because you're here this morning and you're faithful. But sadly, sadly, millions, I really believe, of families have walked away from God's church and, and not returned. You know, I don't, once again, I don't mean this mean or ugly, but when we closed down, when we were told back in 2020, we just had landed from Sri Lanka. I can remember it was the Thursday, March uh, uh, um, 10th, or, and I remember um, uh, that we shut down for like 12 weeks, and, and, and uh, after 12 weeks, 
and we opened up, it's Pentecost Sunday. I look around like, this is crazy. We need to meet. The church needs to, I mean, we did it, and, you know, we were told uh, three quarters of the country is going to be dead. That didn't happen, okay? And so it's like, I didn't want to be reckless. How many know God's not called us to be reckless, amen? So he doesn't want us to be reckless, but God calls us to lay aside our personal safety and take risks, all right? People are going to die. We're always going to have that. Watch this. Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, you can pull this up. Then Jesus said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. I want that to sink in. I want to save my life. I want to do everything I can. And so I was in this big box store in this community here checking out, and some woman just came unglued off of me. And she kept screaming, my health is more important than God in church. And she kept screaming at him like, okay, give me my receipt. And I walked out. <laughs> Listen, you don't know, God forbid you walk out of here. God forbid you die or your, your heart stopped. You're gone. <laughs> Listen, the most important thing is not so much our health and safety. It's the kingdom of God. It's his eternal life. Are you right with God? Amen. Come on. <laughs> glory to God I, I don't mean that mean or ugly but you know, we have to have the right perspective we have the right perspective if this is true then Christians would not gather in North Korea because it's illegal if this is, you know, if this is true then, then, then maybe the Chinese Christians should, should not gather uh, if this is true we pull down numerous flags of nations that I have been in and, and some of you have been in and countries that every most of those countries it's illegal to preach the gospel but we go anyways well, pastor, you're doing something illegal. No, it's a risk. It's a risk for the kingdom. How many with me say amen? And so we're not to be, once again, reckless. And I don't think we've, you know, embraced recklessness. But risk is not your enemy, but it's the calling of every Christian. Did you hear that? So what happens? We wisely take risks. We live for Jesus. We speak for Jesus. We are ready and willing to die for Jesus. Can I get an amen? If I perish, I perish. For me to live is Christ. To die is gain, Paul said. Amen. Pastor preaching the truth. Now, let me get back to where I'll get off of that. One Bible commentator says about the sin of the 10 spies was this little deviation from what they were told to do. This is so important about when you, whose opinion you listen to, how can it affect your family and actually could have destructive effects in your life. If you don't get God's perspective in this season, you, you spiral, you spiral, and, and, and we don't want that. <clears throat> this little deviation of what they were told, what started as a mere subjective assessment of how they would mil militarily conquer the land, they ended up doubting the ability of Almighty God himself to bring them into his land, in the land of milk and honey. They failed to establish the kingdom of Israel in the land, all due to the sin of 10 people. 10 people brought bondage. So fast forward for 40 years later, their children and grandchildren were grown up and they're now ready to cross into the Jordan River, go into the land that God had promised them. And it's 40 years later. And the two that are left from that are Joshua and Caleb. They're in their 80s now. <laughs> Why? Because God is faithful. He'll keep you alive for his purposes. Amen? And, but the problem was giants. Now, I got I pulled this up, and some of you, I don't know how much, there's a slide. I don't know if you're able to, the giants, okay? You think, oh, wow, that is insane, Pastor Mike. <clears throat> giants were in the land. Genesis 6, 4 talks about the Nephilim. The Nephilim, now, some people believe that, well, that's, you know, commentators say they're lying. In Genesis, it talks about how the sons of God <clears throat> had relations with the daughter of man. And the Nephilim, or giants, was an offspring. Uh, some say, well, it was just part of the line of Seth. And uh, listen, you can, you know, have people in some average height today is, you know, between five and a half to six and a half feet, somewhere in there. Uh, they, they have discovered and found bones of uh, a woman that her femur, would they could calculate just by that in Texas, she was 14 feet tall. They were taller back then, 
okay? And they're starting to discover more and more. But, you know, the enemy doesn't want that out because that would prove the Bible, once again, is true. But I happen to believe, in, and, and, and I've studied this for, for many, many years, and a lot of it, I haven't talked about it because I think this is a day and age, I think you're going to begin to see more and more things that are really challenging for a lot of people in their faith. But my point is, is uh, the land is occupied with these incredibly strong, huge, and powerful people called the Anakites. Numbers 13 talks about the sons of Anak. Now, um, you would think now after 40 years, they're struggling through the desert, they're going to enter their promised land and they're, not, they're going to just walk right in. No, there's the enemy. And see, here's the thing. Satan caused these giants to be conglomerated on the promised land, in the promised land. Think about that. Satan was already strategizing. How many know life doesn't get easier or more forgiving? We just get stronger or more resilient. Amen. <laughs> so they were powerful. And uh, without getting into a whole sermon on this, because you have a few minutes left, but uh, Lord willing, sometime maybe we'll talk about these giants and, and, and some of the things that I believe that actually happened where the sons of God, they were angelic beings and having relation. They weren't just bullies or tyrants. They actually mingled with the DNA of human DNA and they created this offspring. And that's why God said <clears throat> the only righteous seed was who? Noah. Noah was the last. So Satan was effective enough. Some of you looking at me like, oh God, where's he going? Satan was effective enough to destroy and contaminate a demonic seed in all of the bloodline except Noah. But how many of you know that the blood is not transferred from the woman to the child, that it's only from the man? Because that's why, if you think about it, a heavenly, what happened to uh, uh, Mary? Mary was supernaturally conceived by what? The spirit, Amen. Are you still with me? Some of you, some of you know what I'm talking about, right? So, so a, a heavenly spiritual being conceived Mary in her stomach. And, and so Satan did that. And that's why we have these giants. We had Gath, who the Bible says his bed was a certain amount of cubics. He was about 14 feet tall. He had, he had six fingers on each and six toes. How I many of there was something wrong with that DNA? All right, I mean, so they intermingled. Goliath, what was he? He's a giant, about between 10 to 12 feet tall. And, you know, like what? The, 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 so Satan had these giants in the land. They were descendants, and the Anakites were descendants of the giants. And so we see there was this intermingling of the supernatural. You know, incidentally, it says when Jesus returns, what does it say it's going to be like the days of what? What's happening today? Now, listen, they're able to take certain organs and raise them in a pig and use them in a human. And it's like, well, okay. And the kidneys and heart. I think they just did a heart transplant, I think, uh, from grown from a pig. But as in the days of Noah, well, it says they were marrying and giving in marriage, right? Well, that happens. There's no big deal. No, what was happening? They were messing with the DNA and it got in to the culture and it contaminated. And that's why the Lord said, I've had it. This generation of Kurtz, his years would be 120. The flood happened. They were all wiped out. But Noah was the one that was righteous. But you see, Noah had three sons, right? And he had three wives. Because the Bible says in Genesis, what does it say? It said it happened before the flood and it happened again. Satan did it again. He intermingled. That's why we had more giants post-flood. Anyhow, I will get off that for some of you going, oh God, where's he going? Giants were in the land, but they had to conquer the giants. Uh, watch this, Amos 2.9, a great verse. Amos 2.9, the Bible says, As my people watched, I destroyed the Amorites, Anak and the sons, though they were as tall as cedars. Well, it was hyperbole. It's just, a, a, you know, or it's, it's, it's a, a proverbial speech. No, they were as tall as cedars. They were huge, huge. How many know cedars can grow 25 feet, 30 feet. I mean, it's insane. It's insane. And they were as strong as oaks. And he said, I destroyed the fruit on their branches and I dug out their roots. In other words, he cut them off and they were eliminated and they were all gone. Somebody say amen. Well, stand with me if you would, please. I'm going to conclude. I think I dumped a lot on you here today. Deuteronomy 9.3. can pull that up, please. So know today with confident assurance that the Lord your God is crossing the Jordan River before you like a devouring, devouring fire. He will destroy them and he will subdue them before you. And you shall drive them out and destroy them what? Somebody shall quickly. Friends, we're living in God's destiny moment. You are living in God's destiny moment. And I'm hearing testimonies about families and what God is doing in and through their life. And people are stepping up and faith is being arisen in many of your lives. And I pray for all. 
But, you know, unlike their parents that talked themselves out of it, this new generation that crossed over young men and women, they had the boldness. Somebody showed the boldness to go in and, and to believe God's promise and they quickly conquered. I believe the season the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has entered in, even though it's been the most difficult season globally, this whole planet, there is a quick work happening upon us. I said a quick work happening where you're going to see people coming in into the new building. You're thinking, how do we handle this? Well, can you start a class to, to help, you know, marriages? Can you start a class to just give them the ABCs? Because we have a whole generation that don't even know the Bible. They don't even know who Moses, uh, Moses, who, what? Parents didn't teach them nothing. They need to be trained. That's why that building's there. The building isn't the end. It's the beginning. It's the beginning of a quick work, a massive work. Because why? God loves people. The last verse is Proverbs 29, 25. Just like God said to them, I'm going to cross over ahead of you and take care of those enemies. I'm going to do it quickly. God is fighting your battles. But Proverbs 29, 25, as we end with this, it is, it is dangerous, the Bible says, to be concerned with what others, others think of you. But if you trust in the Lord, you are safe. Another verse says, the fear of man brings a snare. But whoever trusts in and puts his confidence in the Lord will be exalted in safe. Every head bowed, please, this morning. When we follow others' opinion, instead of getting God's opinion, we can delay, we can shipwreck our destiny moment by not listening to God's thoughts in that season. Just because somebody has a, a white robe and a stethoscope doesn't mean they're the authority over your life. Amen? Just because they have a, a DR before their name doesn't mean they are the answer in God's voice to you. We have to seek the Lord and get God's opinion on our life and our family, and we need to act and move. And a lot of times, let me just tell you this, God's opinion is contrary to what the world thinks. It's contrary. It's not what, well, to see if people believe this. Let's believe God's opinion about our life and not be distracted. Amen? Not following man's opinion. We don't want to miss our destiny moment, and we are not. You are not if you follow God's opinion. You're here this morning as a pastor. I'm, I'm not right with the Lord. I need to get right with God. This is a great day. The Bible says now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. You know, you feel, and it's, Lord, I'm backslid. I've fallen away. I'm not as passionate. I, I've lost my fire. I've lost my zeal. And I've allowed whatever, this insanity the last few years to just shipwreck me. Or, or you know what? I've embraced the opinion of, of others, and it's I, I, I am worse off today, and I'm not thriving than when I was a few years ago. You get take that step of faith and, and repent, number one, and invite Christ into your life. Make him Lord of your life. You're here this morning. You see, that's me. I want to pray for you. I'm going to ask all of us to pray corporately. But if that's you, pray this prayer. God will come into your life. He will save your spirit man or your spirit woman. He will make himself known to you. He will reveal himself to you. The Bible says you will receive eternal life and begin the journey of faith here and now. If that's you here this morning or maybe online, you're listening. Let's pray together. Say to me, say, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sin. Jesus, I give you my life. Now take it. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, Jesus, for filling me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord worship praise right now here this morning? Hallelujah. Amen. So whose opinion are we going to follow? Come on, God. Whose opinion are you going to follow? How do you get that? You pray. You seek the Lord. You stay in fellowship. You listen to wise counsel. You filter all the other stuff. And when it goes contrary to the word of God, you go, not for me. I'm following God. Amen. Hallelujah. I'd like to invite all the workers to come forward at this time. Uh, these are safe people. They're prayed up. They're here for you. Perhaps maybe you need 
uh, hands laid upon you, or prayer of faith, prayer of agreement, whatever it may be, uh, they are here to minister life for you. Let me bless you. Father, I bless the people of God. I thank you for the, your ten, their attentiveness here today. Lord, I pray that all the words that were spoken, that you would uh, just bring clarity, Father God, and it would cause many of us to, to dig deeper, to dig into your word of God and to dig uh, 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 into scripture, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, as we pray at the beginning of the service, that, Lord, you would just bring a spirit of, 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 of perseverance and tenacity over this church body. Lord, that we would quiet our spirits, that we would sit before you, Lord God, that we would seek you with all our heart, mind, soul, and spirit. Lord, that we would be passionate about your purpose, your opinion, what you think in this season, not man's. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen. Thank you. God bless you all.